Welcome to our Meet the Experts TV Directors panel. I'm Rob Lucuria, Senior Editor at Gold Derby here with Julianne Robertson from Bridgerton, Stephen Canals from Pose, David Weil from Solos, and Rachel Lee Goldenberg from Unpregnant. Guys, uh, thanks for joining me today. You know, I love asking directors um, interesting questions that I, because I just want to know about your craft, because I have no idea how to direct anything. So the first question is this, and I'm going to go straight to you first, Dave. How or when do you know when you have the perfect shot or take? Ooh, um, I don't know if you ever truly know. I mean, I mean, I think you, you discover one of the beauties is you discover so much in the edit. Um, but I think there is a moment, and especially I work with some incredible actors. When I can't even remember to call cut, I think that's when you know that you have the most you know brilliant take that has just transported you and your cinematographer, your scripts, you know, supervisor. Um, I think just getting lost in the moment and realizing, oh, shoot, I'm the director. I got to got to call cut that. I think that's when you know. Yeah, uh, that, that sounds pretty cool. Um, Rachel, what about you? When do you know that you've got it and it's time to move on? Uh, I, I, I think it's just a matter of trusting yourself, because like David said, it's hard to really know. And certainly I've been you know, I've done nine takes of something and I'm positive that take nine, we nailed it. And then we get the edit, we use take two. And, you know, but, but uh, I, I mean, I'm sort of a firm believer that I, I just need to trust my instincts because there's so much pressure and there's so much going on. And so if I have something to say, I'll never stop if I've not done and I'll keep thinking of things to say and asking for things. And if we need to take a break and figure it out, like really getting to the bottom of something and, 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 feeling confident so that we can all move on knowing and, and so that the actors have that trust of knowing I will never move on until it's fantastic. So you're you're good. You can relax. If I say we're good, then I promise we're good. God, I just can't imagine if you had like an OCD type thing like I do, I'd still be shooting something from seven years ago. <laughs> Julie, are you on the same Julianne, are you on the same page? Yes, um, I agree with everything that's been said so far. The only thing that I'd add is um, I very early on in my career I learned that if you're doing a one-er, uh, a one-er is a long steady cam sequence um, and it, it can take hours to rehearse and then get the one-er. If you get the one-er, you need to move on because you're never going to get that one-er again and everybody will be like, if you say, no, no, I got it the first time, guys, Every the whole crew will be frustrated and they'll want to get it the second time. So that's that's the only thing that's springing to my mind. That's very interesting. Uh, Stephen, are you on, what do you think about getting the perfect shot or take? Well, what's perfect? <laughs> <laughs> you know, as says the Virgo, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's it's trying to get the get all the pieces of the puzzle you know uh as close to the, what you had in your head as possible mm -hmm. and so i right. think similar to what julianne just said it's like for me it's at the moment like i'll know it when i see it you know and and hopefully fingers crossed it's like in the first three to five takes <laughs> but yeah. you know it's like once you sort of get it you're like oh okay that's pretty close to what i envision okay let's move on yeah, so that's interesting because as the overthinking Virgo of the group, Stephen, um, I think it's probably healthy for you to say what is perfect because otherwise you will just go around in circles. Um, I guess a similar question, and I'll say with you, Stephen, is um, what do you wish you knew when you first started out about the ups and downs of directing that you know now? Hmm. Um, I think the most important thing is to be kind with yourself. Um, I think, like, I know I put a lot of pressure on myself to be perfect. So it's funny that we're talking about perfection because um, that neuroses, I think it really comes out on the page. And as we were discussing earlier, um, you know, the writing process isn't complete until frankly the entire process isn't complete until the thing is airing <laughs> you can always go back and continue to tinker and make changes and but i think when it comes to filming it's like 
either the actors are present and they're on or they aren't are not you know and it's you you know the camera is in just the right position and you've got just the you know the perfect shot or you don't um and you have a finite amount of time you know and in the midst of of a global pandemic you know we we had even less time than we typically would to get the shot you know to shoot whatever the scene is and so um, I think the the thing I've learned, especially in this final season, is it's okay to let myself off the hook just a little bit. You know that it's okay to say, I really wanted this to be whatever, however perfect is defined for you, and it may not be just that, and that is okay. Right. You know, I think many of us could take that into any of our professions, really. Um... Yeah, I think it's really important message. Julianne, what about you? Um, what would you say to a younger self? Um, I, I would say to my younger self, trust your team. Uh, once you have a good, strong team around you, you don't have to be the expert in every single area. That's, mm-hmm. that's why everybody's there. Uh, when I was younger, I don't know. I think I was I was trained at the BBC. They still had direct training course back then, and they went through every department and they told you everything that every department was looking for. And I thought, gosh, I have to be across all of that. Um, but at a certain point, you can you know you can start. You can just trust people and become a real member of a team and be a real collaborator. And that's the, you don't have to be in charge. <laughs> I, I came from the theater where the director's role is very different. Um, and so that that took that took some time to learn, I think. Mm, okay, that's, that's interesting. David, what about you? I, I would just say have no regrets. I mean, if you have that voice speaking to you and saying, just get one more take or just move that a little left or let's try that camera dolly just one more time. I feel like I'll, like forever, you know, there's certain moments in, in any show I do where forever I will, even when it airs, I'll be like, oh, like your heart will just sink and your stomach will drop when that small little moment that only you will remember uh, comes up. So I would just say, leave it all on the table, you know, capture everything you need um, and, and give yourself that gift, you know, of, of allowing yourself that opportunity to realize your vision fully. And Rachel? I think my, my, my biggest thing that I've sort of learned is just to accept my own style and how I like to do things and sort of starting out and, you know, going to film school and studying all the masters and hearing, you know, these directors talk and they talk about, you know, they only do months of rehearsal. And I'm like, I don't know what I would do with months of rehearsal. What do I, we just sit and stare at each other for a while. I don't, you know, like I like I love having, you know, a few rehearsals and then we shoot it or um, just the sort of what, you know, kind of settling into the, the way that I like to work and the longer that I do it, maybe maybe it's just because I'm deluding myself because I've been doing it long enough, but it's like, oh no, this can just be how I work and this can just be my style and I don't have to hold myself up to some some standard of what a director is supposed to be like or how they're supposed to act. Yeah, that's a really good one too. You're, they're all very good answers. I'm gonna, I should have written this down because I think we could all take these, these lessons as we move forward. Well, this is my favorite question, okay guys, because um, when I did my one year of film school, when I was much, much younger, obviously I didn't become a director. I became something else. But uh, I, so, but, but back then, I remember always thinking, what was that one shot or film or series that it moved or inspired me that I watched over and over again that made me want to maybe get, in, get into filmmaking? For me, I'll go first, but I would like to know what you all think. For me, it was The Godfather, surprise, surprise. And it's like shots like at the Meadowlands when, when the character says, um, take the gun, leave the cannoli, and you've got those reeds in the background or those, you know, those very faint footsteps that you hear a little bit later on in that film. It just really, really affected me and made me want to get into film in some way or another. So I'm wondering from you guys, what was that film or series that you watch from time to time that really inspired you as an artist? Who'd like to go first? I'm opening it up to the group. I'll go. <laughs> okay. So for me, it was Goodfellas. Um, and I was a theatre director. And when I first decided I wanted to start working with the camera, I, I couldn't figure out what, the, it didn't make any sense to me what, what I was watching on screen. So what I did was I took 
I think it, gosh, it must have been a VHS. <laughs> and I, I would watch it shot by shot and then I, with the sound down, and then I would draw plans of where I felt like Scorsese had put the camera and how he was using the, that as a storytelling device, using the camera as a storytelling part of the journey. Uh, and so that for me was, it was very, took a very long time and it was hard, but that really unlocked a lot of mysteries for me. Wow. Yeah, that is a great film. Who else? Um, go for it, Rachel. I get, I can, I can go. Um, I, for me, I mean, my sort of favorite films were always changing, and and so it's not like I have some great formative. You know, the one that's endured as 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 my favorite is Thelma and Louise. Um, that's one that just like I feel like every whatever I'm working on, if I watch it, I'll take something from it, and it'll it'll work. It'll somehow apply. It's like a, a magic thing. Um, but you know, I think I think it's it's more that 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 rather than always going back to one thing i'm i'm like whatever i'm watching whatever i'm taking in i'm getting something from and that my path to filmmaking was more the first time that i had a camera in my hand and realizing that i could express myself in a way that i you know that I, i'm like a terrible fine artist and i always would try and just be horrible at it and then could really make things with film and that was what was magical to me and then i sort of backed into watching everyone else and how they do it after I had discovered that. Yeah, that's a good film too. Um, Stephen, how about you? Uh, for me, filmmaking is storytelling. Um, and so the first time that I knew that I wanted to be a filmmaker, or excuse me, a storyteller, uh, <laughs> I would say it was 1986. And there were two specific films that I saw in the theater that year um, that really impacted my decision to want to pursue this career. And those two films are The Color Purple and Transformers, the animated movie. Um, and both of those films, they, they, as a young person, they just both made me feel. And I think that was the it's interesting, but I can't think of any other films until that moment where I thought, oh wow, whatever, is ha whatever experience I'm having right now as a result of going on the journey with these characters, I wanna do that too. Wow, yeah, they're both very good too. It's so different. Uh, and finally, David. You know, I, I think I felt, I live on Long Island. I grew up on Long Island, so I would take the LIRR in and, and go see theater. So, so for me, wanting to become a storyteller really began in the theater. And, and I think seeing, you know, Mike Lee's films, you know, Secrets and Lies, for example, and just seeing how real uh, drama can be and feel, uh, how truly real with all its blemishes and mistakes. Um, and then I think, you know, so that's how it would inspire to me to be a writer. But in filmmaking, I'm, I'm very verbose, I think, as a writer. And so I really wanted to, you know, re, you know study, uh, great artists who have such great restraint as filmmakers. And so for me, No Country for Old Men is a, is a great example of that. I think there's so much, you know, wonderful tension or as Hitchcock would always say, there's no terror in the bang. It's everything that, that kind of leads up to it. So, um, you know, I try to study those films uh, in particular, but I don't know, there's so many, it's such a, such a hard question. I know, David, I just bought I just bought uh, Secrets and Lies because uh, it just came out in the Criterion edition. Oh yes, I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. it's such a great movie. Uh, yeah, that movie just yeah. I mean Brent, Brenda Blethyn and Marion Jean Baptiste, just like those two together on the screen. Like I'm actually getting goosebumps just talking about it. That and that, but doesn't that tell you something, everybody? Like this is art that gives us goosebumps. Like it makes us feel all of your work that we're talking about today on this panel has made us feel something. And you're all talking about how these shows made you feel even Goodfellas, which is like in my top 10 of all time. Um, that's just, I mean, the precision in that, in that film is, is awe inspiring. So you've all made really good choices. Thank you so much for sharing them. Um, my final question is a little deeper but um, I think it's a, a one that I'm really interested to hear what you all have to say. And that is so much has transpired over the last 12 to 18 months, right? Culturally, politically, and for all of us in many ways, personally, 
And, um, and, and so I'm wondering, what are your hopes for the next 12 months ahead, particularly as professionals in this industry? What are you hoping to see, not just in relation to the pandemic, but just generally, where are we headed um, as a community? And I'll, I'll, I'm not really sure who wants to go first. It's a deep question, <laughs> but I'm really curious to see what you all have to say. Um, I'm going to pick one at random. Let's go with Stephen first. Well, immediately, I'm thinking about my favorite decade of cinema, which is the 1970s, and mm -hmm. the way that so much of the work, so many of the films that were coming out of that time, and especially the films that I really love of that um, of that decade, like Network, for example, were all in response to what was happening culturally. And so the thing that I'm most excited about is that we continue to see really incredible filmmakers. Um, and for me in particular, just because th these are communities I'm part of and, and the people who I know and love so much that women and people of color and LGBTQ plus people continue to use their voice to create work that is in direct response to everything that's happening in the world right now. Um, you know, I, I, as I mentioned um, earlier, I think, you know, niche is really the new mainstream. And so that for me is what's so exciting is that we're seeing all of these stories that historically have always been pushed to the margins suddenly coming front and center. Um, that excites me. And so, uh, you know, I, that's my, that's my hope. I think that we're starting to see that, which is really great. So. Yeah, I, I, is the new mainstream. Go for it, Julianne. I would just like to say I, I would echo absolutely everything that Steve's just said. I think that that's a fantastic response. Um, and I, I'd say I, I would like to see uh, the stories of people that are all shapes and sizes on the screen. <laughs> Um, I, I think that just broadening that representation is something that's absolutely essential. And um, it's definitely, that's definitely what I really hoped, hope for the next year. Yeah, absolutely. And I will just quickly say, it's, and it's so that people can see themselves, but it's also that we can see others. And so the otherization, I suppose, if that's even a word, of various communities um, might dissipate when we start seeing a variety of stories on our screens. Um, what about you, Rachel? Yeah, I mean, it's it's gonna be boring because I don't disagree with anything that <laughs> Stephen and Julianne are saying. But yeah, it was, you made me think of, um, in, in an interview recently, I heard uh, Shaka King say he wants to make work that has utility. And that word really stuck with me, utility. Not just, you know, has a nice message, but actually is effective and, and, and uh, actively helpful in society and in culture. And so that's sort of what I would like to see. And then specifically, selfishly for my, for my issue, uh, I, I would just love to see um, more abortion representation in, mm. in media and not, you know, I, I'm, I'm proud of Unpregnant and happy to have an abortion movie, but it's something that's so common in culture that I think having it not be front and center in media, but just being, in an episode, a character goes and gets an abortion because that's you know something that one in four people who can get pregnant will do. Um, that's that's my my personal hope for the next yeah. year. That's important too because Rachel, as you know, so much of that issue has been co-opted by politicization, and it's not that for for most of us. For most people, that's a very personal and universal thing that we should be free to talk about. So, good point, David. What about you? I mean, everyone said it so much more brilliantly than, than, than I ever could. I, I would just add, you know, I, I think it's the great quote of if you're going to show the wound to really provide the medicine as well. And, and I think all, all these you know, brilliant stories um, of, of this last year, I think, provide that catharsis in medicine. And I think to see more of that moving forward uh, will be so, so necessary and really special. Yeah, absolutely. All of you, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for making us feel something. Thanks for entertaining us. And most of all, for my selfish reasons, thanks so much for giving me really great answers today. It's been a real pleasure chatting with you all. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.